Welcome everyone to our Lincoln at the Library lecture today. We're so pleased that you have joined us virtually um, on our Zoom platform for our presentation on Lincoln and election. We'd like to thank the Friends of the Library for generously providing this series year after year. We'd also like to thank our speaker today for being so flexible. Dr. Nicole Edgeson is the Alexander M. Bracken Professor of History at Ball State University. She is the author of A Generation at War, The Civil War Era in a Northern Community, as well as numerous other books and Civil War articles. She was most recently the DFH Distinguished Visiting Professor at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado. Dr. Etchison, whenever you are ready. Hello, everyone. I'm going to be kind of a disembodied voice for a while and share the presentation that I put together for this afternoon. Um, so I want to thank Emily for that introduction. Emily was actually in my class a few years ago at uh, Ball State. And um, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be back with her. And she did a great job of arranging everything. And it's always a pleasure to do a program for the Allen County Public Library, which is one of the great treasures in Indiana, uh, not just for its Lincoln collection, but for its genealogy collection and all the work that it, it does in local community. And thank you all for turning out on this afternoon when uh, there are leaves to be raked and all, all kinds of work that needs to be done. So I'm going to talk today about elections in the Civil War era. And uh, before we came live here, um, Kurt Wichter mentioned that this is a timely topic. And in fact, when I picked up the Sunday Muncie Star Press this morning, there was a headline about de-escalating tensions uh, at uh, the voting booths um, on election day. And so what I'm gonna talk about today essentially is that American elections have always been tumultuous. And so some of what we're going through today has some perhaps parallels in an earlier era. I wanna start first in talking about elections in with campaigning. And so this uh, is one of George Caleb Bingham's, the Missouri artist's famous campaign uh, election, one of his famous election series paintings. This is the one that's called Stump Speaking and shows the speaker uh, appealing to the audience. You'll notice here that, of course, the speakers and the audience are all white and they are all male. This is a very campaigning elections, all of this is a very masculine, uh, very white process. We are in, in the Civil War era, the, era, the inheritors of Jacksonian democracy, which meant the expansion of the vote, but it was expanded in the sense that it was expanded to all white men, regardless of property ownership, um, or religion or other disqualifications, but it was not expanded to women, it was not expanded to men of color. And in fact, uh, one of the ways in the 1800s, if you wanted to denigrate a campaign rally held by the other party, what you wrote in your newspaper accounts was that the only people who turned out to hear someone like Abraham Lincoln were women and children. So if you were a Democrat, you might write that about a Whig like Lincoln. Only women and children showed up, meaning nobody important came to listen to this candidate. These are non-voters. They don't matter. And I'll go back to my original slide, which of course is from the Reconstruction era. And I think you can see it's a stump speaking moment, but the stump speaker is a black man and he is appealing to other black men. And in the background, unlike with the Bingham painting, you see women listening. And we know that in the 1800s, you know, white women 
did come to campaign rallies. Uh, but there's a sense with this reconstruction image that women's participation, even though it's on the margins, it's present in a way that you're not seeing in Bingham's sort of 1850 representation. Another element about campaigning, uh, they did things that seem very odd to us today, rolling balls and raising poles. Parties in the Civil War era were always having, this is a, a Harrison ball rolling, um, and, and even more frequently, you'll see in the newspapers talk of the Democrats had a poll raising, uh, the Whigs had a poll raising. And what this is really about is to raise a huge tall log, to raise a pole or to push this ball from one location miles to another location is really demonstrating that you had the, the people to do this. It showed support. We had enough people to put up this really tall pole. We also um, like to think that campaigning involved reasoned debate. So on the left, I have an image of Lincoln Douglas uh, in their famous 1858 debates for what was then the Senate seat held by Stephen A. Douglas in Illinois, and Lincoln was the challenger. And the Lincoln-Douglas debates have long been held up in our political mythology as these incredibly uh, reasoned debates. And every year when I, I teach my students, when we get, when we get to the Lincoln-Douglas debates, uh, I will tell them whatever the presidential debate looks like, you may hear the commentators on the news saying, well, this is in the great tradition of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And I tell the students, it's not going to be anything like the Lincoln-Douglas debates. I mean, Lincoln and Douglas uh, debated for several hours, and each of them got to speak for uh, an hour or more at a time. So th these were long and lengthy discourses. Now, they were often repetitious, uh, and they often uh, made um, uh, scurrilous charges against each other. So in some ways, they would not hold up to our ideal of what a reasoned debate should be like, but they're not like the sound bites uh, that we get in the typical um, presidential or candidate debates where the news moderator says, oh, Mr. President, you have one minute. Uh, no, um, they, they got at least half an hour and in some cases over an hour to lay out their argument to the voters. And people stood, as you can see in this image, and they listened to this. And there are stories of people perching in treetops to get a better view. So Lincoln and Douglas, it is a sort of model of allowing the candidate to make a lengthy presentation to the voters if it isn't necessarily always the the greatest oratory that either Lincoln or Douglas ever produced. But on the right, I have an image of what were called the White Awakes, who were uh, Republican supporters in the 1860 election. And David M. Potter, a long time ago, was a very distinguished uh, historian, and he pointed out that we like to think of the Lincoln, uh, of the 1860 election, as one that was about these ideals and that was based on a certain debate on the role of slavery in the United States. And that we tend to forget that the 1860 election and elections in these periods were often uh, very emotional. Um, they were about turning people out with, with basic appeals that were not always terribly rational. And Potter pointed to the Wide Awakes uh, marches. And these are young men. You might notice they're dressed in rather military array. Um, and they carry torches. 
Um, and, and they're marching again in, in a sort of semi-military fashion. And this was a sort of hurrah. This was to turn people out. This was to show that people had, uh, that the Republicans had support. And the Republicans aren't the only ones who, who did this. If you go back to 1858, when Stephen Douglas was traveling around the state of Illinois, he traveled on a train that had a cannon on the back of it. And they, they would fire off uh, the cannon to let people know that, that Douglas had arrived. So it was all this panoply that was intended to appeal to voters at a psychological and emotional level that was not necessarily rational. And that had been part of American campaigning. Now we get to the actual voting. Voting is a public act. And you can see that here in this image of African-American men voting after the Civil War. Uh, you can see it in another famous Bingham painting from the 1850s called the County Election. Men, again, are out in public. And in neither of these images uh, do we have women. And uh, the voters are you know, casting the ballot where people can see them do it. Not like our uh, going into a little voting booth and, and no one can, can see what we are doing. Um, and you can see on the left uh, a sample of a ticket uh, when Lincoln ran in 1860. Um, the ballots were handed out not by the government, but by the party. They were colored. And they had images like this eagle and the flag, which was to help illiterate voters. And this started before African American men started voting. So we're assuming illiterate white voters in the Jacksonian era who can uh, be told that their party ticket is a certain color or it has an eagle on it. And in fact, one method of fraud was if you were the Democrats and you knew that the, the Whigs were going to have a blue ballot, so you printed up a bunch of blue ballot and ballots and handed those out to unsuspecting uh, Whig voters. This is the way people tried to cheat. The other thing that you'll see in both of these images of voting are the men who were the judges of the election. So if I go to the Bingham painting, you see up there uh, at the apex on the right, the man in the blue coat who is a judge of the election and he is swearing in the voter in the red shirt. Uh, I think I, I included this one from the Reconstruction era because I think it has an even better image of the judges of the election. The three men on the left, including the one African-American with the glasses, because usually there are three judges of the election. And what they do is uh, verify that you are a legal voter. Um, they can challenge, are you of age? Do you actually reside here? Are you a legitimate voter? And then uh, there were three judges of the election uh, because if there was a challenger, if one of the judges challenged or one of the other voters challenged and said, he doesn't live here, uh, he's, he's not eligible to vote, um, then the judges would vote. And if two of them said, yeah, we're going to accept this ballot, then it was accepted. Uh, so the judges had real power to decide who got to vote. And the, the equivalent in our system are when you, you go in and you check in with the, uh, the election officials. They, they, we don't really think of them in the same way as judges who get to determine whether we vote, but the origins of that goes back to the system of having judges of the election. Um, a couple of challenges. Residency, there were residency requirements, but they were not generally enforced, particularly in a state like Indiana when it was settling. Um, it was quite common for newcomers to arrive and they were new settlers and they hadn't maybe been in the jurisdiction long enough, but 
they might be allowed to vote. Um, Ken Winkle has done some work and he says residency requirements on the frontier are, are really um, not made an issue of because they expect new settlers to be coming in. Um, age issues are interesting here with this image that I've got of reconstruction because a lot of former slaves do not know how old they are. Now, clearly the older man who is you know, standing there with his hand to his chin is over 21 and, and should be eligible to vote. But some of the younger men might actually not be. And there's a, a case from South Carolina of one of the judges of election is the former owner. And he says that one of the prospective voters isn't 21. And he knows this, the voter doesn't know this, but he knows this because he has the plantation records and he knows when the man was born. The voter does not know. Prospective voter did act, actually not know when he had been born. Um, so there can be challenges on these issues. It was, well, I've got this ballot up here uh, from the Lincoln election. Um, it was not considered undignified um, to run for office, the kind of old colonial sense that you stood for office and people selected you had given way to a little more willingness of candidates to campaign, as Lincoln and Douglas did in 1858. Um, but it was not considered proper to vote for one's self. So on election day in 1860, Lincoln had not voted and uh, some Republicans came to him and said, well, you need to support the party, you need, you need to vote. Uh, but when Lincoln got his ballot, he actually cut out his name before he cast it because that was not really uh, proper to vote for yourself. It, it was too presumptuous. This environment, particularly as you can see in the Bingham painting, um, over on the left where we do have an African-American, he's pouring drinks for a guy. And you see over on the far right, someone who's probably had way too much to drink and kind of in the center, a uh, man holding up another voter. So part of the manliness of these elections was, was that they were very fueled by alcohol um, and they could be uh, very rowdy. And in the mid 1800s, when you start to get advocates for women's suffrage, such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her supporters, one of the rebuttals that was made uh, was that the polls were no fit place for a woman. I mean, this, this is drunkenness. This, this uh, is just really not somewhere where uh, decent women should be going and uh, their menfolk um, shouldn't uh, allow them to come here. Now, the women's suffrage advocates would uh, reply that, well, if women came to the polls, you wouldn't have all of this rowdiness and drunkenness and it would clean uh, American elections up, uh, but the, the very masculine nature of polling raised issues about the appropriateness of women being in, involved in it. And, and it also led, uh, particularly by the turn of the 20th century, to a lot of jocular talk about, well, we couldn't have elections in a livery stable anymore because the good uh, manly voter is perfectly willing uh, to go and breathe the air of, liber of, of liberty um, in a, a polling place filled with horse manure, uh, but the women would insist on cleaning this up and they wouldn't let the judges of elections smoke their cigars. And so so there, there was a uh, comedy routine around what would happen to these elections if, if you allowed in the, uh, the women who would in, insist on cleaning things up. Well, women's suffrage advocates also made the argument that they would clean things up in the sense that women in the 1800s are more moral and so there would be less fraud at the elections. And 19th century elections had lots of their own different varieties. 
of voting fraud. Um, there's simple stuffing of the ballot box. Now, I'll go back to the Bingham um, image where you see the voter handing in, swearing his oath and, and handing in uh, the ballot. Uh, there are lots of accounts in the newspapers, including from Indiana, of ballot boxes disappearing. And the judges of election took the ballot box, but they didn't deliver it to be counted until the next morning. And when it was counted, it had a lot fewer of one party's ballots in it. And, and there would be uh, election challenges where you would get um, men who would come forward and say, I voted. And you know, we have 100 people in Muncie who voted for the Whig party, but somehow when the ballots were counted, there were only 14 Whig votes. If they, accusations were, were made. Ballot box, who had custody of the ballot box? How long did they have it between the end of voting and turning it in for the official tally? And what happened in between? You get a lot of discourse about this in the newspapers. Uh, I'll go back to, to these images, which are from territorial Kansas in the 1850s. Um, on the right, you see uh, one common form of fraud, which was voting more than once. And so the argument was made, well, it ac actually was pretty conclusively proven that what happened in the first territorial election in Kansas in the spring of 1855 is that Missourians came over into the territory and they line up to vote. And then you see them changing hats and forming a loo line to the whiskey booth where they get a drink, change their hats, which is sort of supposedly change their identity and then they get back in line to vote. So the circular uh, route from the polls to getting a drink to the polls and then back uh, over and over again, um, because it, it did, was conclusively the case that a lot more people voted in that territorial election in Kansas than actually lived in Kansas. And there was a lot of evidence that the Missourians did um, vote more than once. Um, on the left, are the Missourians coming over into Kansas to vote? And on the one hand, you could call this the kind of residency um, issue that I mentioned earlier, that on the frontier, people go to vote in the new territory where they plan to live, but they maybe don't live there yet, or they have just arrived. And the Missourians would say uh, that what they did in the spring of 1855 was very common in places like Indiana and Kentucky, uh, that they hadn't settled in Kansas yet, but they planned to settle in Kansas. So they considered themselves to have a legitimate right to vote in Kansas elections. And a lot of other people disagreed with that. Uh, but, but I would argue at a certain level, the Missourians did what people on the frontier did. They, they voted when they didn't technically meet the residency requirement. Um, now that doesn't excuse the voting more than once. And there was a phenomenon uh, that was called colonizing voters. And it went on through the pre-war period and the post-war period. And what colonizing voters consisted of was if you had a jurisdiction like Kentucky, where everybody knew the Democrats were going to win, um, you move those surplus voters to a close state like Indiana. And you, you'll see in the Indiana newspapers throughout the 1800s, a lot of charges, uh, particularly by first the Whigs and then the Republicans of colonizing Kentuckians. Kentuckians were brought into Indiana to vote to decide this election uh, for the Democrats. In the 1870s, when you get African Americans from North Carolina moving in uh, to Indiana, the Democrats will accuse the Republicans of colonizing voters. 
uh, before the Civil War. Irish laborers, Lincoln specifically mentions this, that he is suspicious of seeing Irish canal laborers or road workers uh, turning up at local elections and suspects that they are colonized voters being brought in by the Democrats to swing a, a close election. So this was a, a common kind of, of voter fraud. Uh, then all this drinking that went on at the elections contributed to what could be an extremely rowdy environment. As I said, this morning's headline talked about de-escalating tensions at the polls in a couple of weeks and fears that uh, voters might be intimidated. Well, in Kansas in 1855 and 1856, voter intimidation consisted of a guy with a Bowie knife walking up to you, putting the knife under your throat and asking you how you were going to vote. So that's real voter intimidation. And if you look uh, at the image on the right, um, you'll see about the fourth guy in line has a knife that he's holding up. So those people who tried to vote in the Kansas elections uh, talked about being threatened with knives and with guns. And you see on the left, the Missourians have a lot of guns and arms when they're, they're coming over. Um, and the Missourians' response was that, well, this happens all the time at elections in Kentucky and Indiana. Um, probably did not happen quite as, with quite as much armament in Kentucky and Indiana as it was happening on the Kansas and Missouri frontier where they were arguing at, at the height of the arguments about slavery. But there's no doubt that in scenes like this, you had election fights, um, you had people who were threatened. So th this election intimidation, election violence was, was not a new phenomenon in the 1850s, 1860s. The, I, I think the apex of this comes in the post-Civil War period when you get actual murders. People are not just threatened, although they were threatened. Republicans, white and black in the South, were definitely threatened. They were given notes uh, and told that if they voted Republican, harm would come to them. Black and white men who were active, and even their women folk, uh, but black and white men and their families who um, were active in elections uh, were taken out and whipped uh, in the 1870s. A black man uh, by the name of Abram Colby was taken out of his cabin, um, whipped and told by the Klansmen who did it that uh, now you won't vote the damned radical ticket anymore. Uh, and then the victims on the right, this is what would happen to you if you did not take those kinds of warnings seriously. You could be lynched. And Eric Foner has called the Ku Klux Klan the military wing of the Democratic Party in the 1870s. Um, but what I'm suggesting here is there's a long history of violence and intimidation and culminating in the actual murder of black and white Republicans and all kinds of atrocities that were committed against Southern Republicans in the post-Civil War period. Um, the Civil War itself, I'll mention here, the great innovation in elections during the actual Civil War is absentee voting. Before the Civil War, if you were not resident in your jurisdiction, if you were not there to show up at the polls, tough luck, you could not vote. There was no such thing as absentee voting. During the Civil War, the Republicans believed that soldiers were strong supporters of their, their party. And there was a great deal of talk about how these 
election rules where you had to be resident uh, were favoring the cowards and the traitors who were staying home. So disloyalty would be voting in Indiana while the loyal Hoosiers would not be able to vote because they were off with Grant's army or with Sherman's army. Um, and so states that had Republican state legislatures passed absentee ballot, uh, absentee voting measures. So Pennsylvania and New York um, had absentee uh, balloting. Um, and this, this is an image of Pennsylvania soldiers voting in camp. Now, uh, the Lincoln Collection at the Allen County Library has some of the correspondence um, that went on over the issue of the Indiana soldiers. Indiana had a Democratic legislature in 1864, so Indiana did not pass an absentee ballot measure during the war. Uh, Governor Oliver P. Morton, a Republican, was very worried about the 1864 elections, and he wanted the War Department to send Indiana soldiers home. And in fact, uh, uh, under Morton's pressure, uh, the War Department was suggesting to General William Tecumseh Sherman in the middle of the Atlanta campaign that he needed to furlough thousands of Hoosier soldiers so that they could go back and vote in the Indiana elections and make sure that Indiana turned out okay. And Sherman was not too happy about this. Um, and ultimately, Indiana soldiers were allowed to go home. Uh, and as I said, the Allen County Public Library Lincoln Collection has, has correspondence about um, this. Uh, Jonathan White, who did a program a few years ago for uh, the Allen County uh, Public Library, uh, argues in his book that there were more soldiers who wanted to vote Democratic, but they were under a lot of peer pressure and pressure from their officers and pressure, in fact, from the War Department um, to, to not vote uh, Democratic. Uh, but the, the long-standing argument has been that the soldiers were pretty pro-Republican, and certainly the soldier vote in 1864 um, it didn't elect Lincoln, but the margin in favor of Lincoln was greater among the soldiers than it was among the civilian population. And uh, I'll add the Southern states, the Confederate states also provided for absentee balloting. Almost all of the Confederate states also allowed, they did not have a presidential election, but they would have had other, um, local state elections going on and they evidently there's been less work done on this but they did have absentee ballot measures as well all right so we've talked about the campaigning and the voting and now i want to talk a little bit about results before we open it up for questions um, these of course are the candidates in the 1860 election lincoln and douglas you're probably familiar with john breckenridge who was uh, the candidate, uh, he, he was James Buchanan's vice president. Um, he was a Kentucky politician and candidate of the Southern Democrats who refused to support the Illinoisan Stephen Douglas. And he ran on a slavery pass to go into the territory's uh, platform. Uh, and then on the lower right, John Bell, an older Tennessee, um, Whig politician who'd been around since the age of Andrew Jackson, and he was the nominee of the Constitutional Unionists, um, who basically wanted to throw the 1860 election into the House of Representatives to prevent Lincoln, whom they considered to be too radical and too dangerous, from being selected. And as we know, that didn't work. But essentially, the 1860 election was a four-way race. And it was basically Lincoln and Douglas in the north and Breckenridge and Bell in the south, where Lincoln, most of the time, was not even on the ballot. Um, despite this four-way split and despite the hopes of the Constitutional Unionists to throw the election into the House of Representatives, Lincoln clearly won. 
he gets, as you see from this electoral map, 180 electoral votes. He gets the majority of the electoral college. Um, his popular vote is actually 39%. And as a side note, I remember when uh, Bill Clinton was first elected that he said on the news, because Ross Perot had taken uh, a big chunk of the popular vote, and I remember Bill Clinton saying, well, that he had gotten more of the popular vote than Abraham Lincoln. And I don't know how many of his hearers would think, oh yeah, you got better than 39%. Well, that's not saying so much. Now, so Lincoln did not get a huge share. He did not get a majority of the popular vote, but that doesn't matter in our system. And the point uh, that I particularly emphasize to my students this semester is Southern secession is not prompted by any argument that Lincoln's election itself is illegitimate. White Southerners in 1860 absolutely agreed that Lincoln was the constitutional selection, the legitimate president according to the constitutional process. They seceded because they didn't want him as their president. Um, so the argument that maybe is going on currently about the results of the process uh, won't be acceptable was not the argument that was the problem in 1860. Now I'm going to skip ahead uh, and to the other really tumultuous election of the Civil War era, which is actually the election of 1876. Uh, by this time, although we've had African-American voting, uh, we also now in the 1870s have the Klan very effectively uh, intimidating and stifling the black vote uh, throughout the South. Um, the 1860 76 election, I would say, was stolen twice. The Democrats stole it first by suppressing the black vote in the South so that if we go here, uh, you will see the Democratic candidate, Samuel Tilden, who was a New York politician. Um, he wins a lot of Southern states that he had no business winning. He wins Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. I mean, that is the result of the work of the Klan as the military wing of the Democratic Party. But of course, he also wins New York, his home state, which had a lot of electoral votes. And he wins Indiana, which was a swing state, which had voted Republican since 1860, but swung back to the Democrats in 1876. But as I said, the suppression of the black vote constituted stealing the election at one level. Uh, then it was stolen again by the Republicans on election night. Their candidate was Rutherford Hayes, uh, governor of Ohio, um, Civil War veteran. Ohio was another important um, swing state, which is why we have a lot of presidents from Ohio. Uh, and on election night, the Republican party leadership figured out that if they could hold South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana, um, which they still ran, Republicans still controlled the state boards that would send the final results. So if those states could report for Hayes, then as you see on the electoral vote, the Republicans could still win by one vote. And so that's what they did. Uh, Republican officials in South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana promptly said Hayes had won their state. They did that by throwing out a lot of Democratic ballots. And it did go into Congress. And the winner of 1876-77 was extremely tense. Um, there were fears of a return to violence. Um, Democrats under the former Civil War General George McClellan were organizing militarily to put Tilden into office. Um, ultimately, one of the reasons that it did not break out into a violent democratic resistance against the claimed results 
um, was that Tilden didn't push it. Uh, people talk about Tilden's lack of leadership. He seems to have been a very indecisive person. So he did not push his party to make a military coup on his behalf. Uh, but the matter was not settled until two days before the official inauguration. Hayes was not selected as president, uh, was not confirmed as the, as the uh, winner of this process and argument that had gone on all through the winter of 1876, 1877, until two days before inauguration day. So that's why I have this image here of them kicking the ballot box around. This is a cartoon from the 1876 election. And I will just conclude with a sentiment that I think we probably all share, um, that we hope for a decisive result in a couple of weeks so that we do not return to some of the tumult that so uh, caused so much pain to our country 150 years ago. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing the screen and come on so that you can ask the questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Etchison, for today. Um, we have some questions in our chat as well as a few that came in via email. Um, no stumpers, I promise. Oh, good. <laughs> so, um, our first question, how long did it take for the results of the election to be made known in 1860? Well, actually, they kind of knew in October, frankly, uh, because in the 1800s, the state elections uh, were not on necessarily on the same day as the federal uh, presidential election. Um, so states could start states would start holding their um, elections in august september october um, so in fact it, although the presidential election would not not be until that tuesday in november um, so in 1860 when uh, Pennsylvania went Republican, and Pennsylvania was a state that the, the Republicans had courted very hard and that they had not won in 1856 and that they knew they needed to win in 1860. Um, when Indiana went Republican, elected Oliver P. Morton as governor, uh, when, when these northern swing states that the Republicans had failed to win in 1856 start going Republican in their state elections. Uh, Stephen Douglas realized by October that the jig was up and that Lincoln was going to be president. And he actually, in, in what I think is one of his finest hours, went south because white Southerners had said, if Lincoln is president, we're seceding. Douglas did a tour through the south trying to persuade people that he knew Lincoln, that Lincoln wasn't a threat, um, obviously, he failed. So, in, in a certain sense, um, they they knew well before election day that it was it was going to be Lincoln. In fact, uh, Republicans in places like Indiana were saying after October, "We still need you to vote in November." They they were worried that their turnoff would slack off because their partisans would get complacent. We also have a question that just came in that kind of relates to it, so I'll ask this one first. Did Lincoln get any votes in the South in the 1860 election? Uh, Lincoln is actually not on the vote. He's not uh, even on the ballot in the Deep South states. Um, and there's a considerable intimidation if you are a, a voter in a border state like Maryland or Republican, uh, or, or Kentucky, excuse me, uh, if you were known to be a Republican. Um, William Sherman was actually in Louisiana as superintendent of a military academy. And of course, he's, uh, he's an Ohioan. Um, his brother is a fairly prominent Ohio Republican. Uh, his, his foster father was a, uh, had been a prominent Whig politician. So um, Sherman 
says in uh, his, his letters, um, he actually doesn't vote uh, because he doesn't really feel that it's appropriate for him. He thinks that in his position as superintendent of this military academy, uh, he should be apolitical. Um, but he writes in his letters that he knows everybody thinks that he didn't vote because he's for Lincoln. Interesting. <laughs> uh, we've got one here. Um, could you talk more about the concept of colonization relative to voting? How widespread, any official federal response and its effects? Oh, well, that leads to a very interesting point. None of this is a federal responsibility. Um, not until, this is, this is one of the major changes that the Civil War brings about in American uh, voting. Uh, setting voting requirements, supervising elections, the federal government has absolutely nothing to do with that um, before the Civil War. So there's no federal response to uh, voter fraud or colonization. That is all a state responsibility. Um, the, the federal government says nothing about who can be um, a voter. And in, in fact, in the Constitutional Convention, uh, they talked about should we set voter qualifications for the people who get to vote for president or Congress? Um, and they decided not to do that because that had always been a state prerogative. It, it was a state right. And they were afraid if we set a qualification um, and that disfranchises certain people who are accustomed to voting in Massachusetts or in Georgia, uh, that, that will create um, unhappiness with this new national government that we're trying trying to create. So the, the latter part of that question is that's what one of the things that the that the Civil War uh, changes is to bring about federal um, requirements and and federal stipulations on what had always always been a state right. Uh, and we still have a kind of mixed system um, where the federal government, a lot of this is being done by our county election officials, by our state officials, um, and, and the federal government has now a greater role than it ever had in the 1800s, but it's still kind of a combination of, of federal oversight and, and states' rights. Um, as for the colonization issue, in swing states like Indiana, they talk about it all the time. And there is, in fact, no registration requirement. This whole business that we have to do uh, in Indiana, you had to get registered to vote uh, by early October. Um, and so that, so that we have uh, proof that you are eligible to vote. I mean, there's, there's no registration uh, requirement in most places in the 1800s. So it's pretty easy to show up and say, well, I've just moved here. And it, as I said, even if there's a residency requirement, the judges of election are likely, likely to say uh, on the frontier, you know, that's okay. Um, so th this was considered also a major reform in the progressive era in the early 20th century, having registration um, so that you couldn't have people who were just showing up. Um, now, with all these kinds of voter frauds, there are lots of allegations and it may be a little more difficult uh, to prove it, but certainly in, in swing districts or in swing states like Indiana, you had a lot of talk um, about the other side bringing in their voters, colonizing people. Excellent point, thank you so much. We've got time, it looks like, for maybe one more. And this one, I think, is my favorite that has popped up. Okay. Um, which type of campaigning would you personally like to bring to 2020 from <laughs> these elections? Um, well, I, of course, I don't know if I want to sit through a four or five hour presidential debate. 
Um, and as I said, even the model of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, there's a lot of repetition. Um, and it, it isn't always the, the glorious rational argument that, that we would like to think our candidates uh, would make. Um, speaking now, I happen to be a member of the Muncie, Delaware County League of Women Voters. And we're very big on being informed about the choice that you're making. Uh, so, and then I assume this is, is true of the League in Fort Wayne. Um, on our website, we have something called Vote 411, which we ask all the candidates to answer questions and to write out their positions. Um, we sponsored uh, candidate debates on Zoom. Uh, and uh, refereed the questions coming in through, through the chat system. So I guess my personal preference is that there's a mutual obligation. I think we'd all like the candidates to be honest with us, to tell us what their policies are and why those policies are what should be enacted. Um, I think sometimes they need to be honest with us about the limitations of, of what government can do for us. Um, particularly, I mean, the presidency is, is not the only branch of government. Years ago, uh, during a congressional election, my nephew was a college student and he said, oh, this isn't a very important election. And I said, well, the president can't pass legislation all on his or her own, um, Congress has a role to play. As we're seeing now, the Supreme Court has a very important role to play. Um, so it's, sometimes there are, it, there seems to be a reluctance on the part of candidates to say, uh, this is not something that as a congressman, a senator, or as president, I can do. And in our candidate forums in, in Muncie, uh, we got some questions where the candidates for county commissioner said, well, that's not what the county commissioner does. I, I won't have any say over that. Um, but the other side of the obligation is ours as voters to be informed about the issue, to be informed about candidates' positions, um, and to make, I, of course, would prefer rational choices, uh, but at, at some level, the, we're all subject to uh, reacting emotionally, psychologically to the banners and, and the uh, sound bites that the candidates are giving us. See, and here I thought you would go with torch-lit parades <laughs> and parties, but I guess the, uh, the openness of candidates works. Um, we did, we've got, looks like about four minutes and I did have two more questions come in. Um, what percentage of eligible voters actually voted in 1860 and 1864? Okay, um, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, and of course, eligible voters were back to adult white men. Um, there is, however, as a general rule, far more um, voter participation than we have had in the modern era. Uh, and I know by the 1890s, um, they are talking about 90% of eligible voters are voting in uh, the 1890s. Now, the, having said that, the immediate problem there is that the eligible voters are, this is an era where black men have been disfranchised. Um, they're not counted in the eligible voters anymore because poll taxes and literacy requirements and other measures that Southern states enacted after Reconstruction have, have shut them out. Um, so, so we know voter pr participation uh, for, for white men was much higher in that era. Um, and I, I think I share the general dismay that everybody has in our modern era that there isn't wider um, voter participation. But I also would caution against a kind of idea of a golden age of voter participation, because that, that part about eligible voters 
you know, often people had been shut out of being eligible voters. And I will say, Emily wanted parades. Um, in 1860, the Republicans have a great campaign song, uh, Lincoln and Liberty. You can listen to it on, um, on YouTube. And they call him the son of Kentucky and the hero of Hoosierdom. I think that could be a top 10 hit now, personally. <laughs> That's just me. It's <laughs> um, a very, very jaunty tune. Oh, I bet it is. Um, our very last question for today. Um, did the Reconstruction Amendments extending the vote to Blacks make federal standards for elections necessary? Yes, um, they did. And in, and in fact, uh, the 15th Amendment in particular is a major federal intrusion uh, into the state right of voting. This is, this is a point where the federal government is telling the states for the pretty much the first time, um, here is a requirement we are going to insist on. Uh, and I would add, since we're at, the, we're at the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment and the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, the 19th Amendment, um, again, 1920, the federal government tells the states, you do not have the state right to deny uh, the vote to women. And, and then again, in the 20th century, uh, the federal government will say, uh, you can't deny the vote to, to people under 21. Um, they, they change the voting age. Um, but going back to the 15th Amendment, yes. Uh, then what happens is in the 18, early 1870s, the Enforcement Acts, um, which provide for federal supervision of elections, um, and they were federal super, uh, supervision um, of congressional and presidential elections because the argument was federal government doesn't have the power to superintend uh, elections of state officials or local officials. But constitutionally, we can make the argument that they can superintend the election of federal officers. Uh, and, and so that gets the federal government the foot in the door to try to protect black voters in those elections. And ultimately, uh, the federal government um, it, it just required so much manpower and it had to be done over a much longer period. The Grant administration made an effort to protect black voters um, and it worked temporarily, but white Southerners just um, had a longer attention span on that issue than the federal government did. Uh, and then the other big moment is the 1965 Voting Rights Act uh, which again was the federal government saying that um, if a majority of people who should be eligible to vote are not voting, then the federal government is coming in. And as, as people probably know, the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court a few years ago in Shelby v. Holder um, removed a key portion of the Voting Rights Act so that the federal government no longer pre-clears, the Justice Department no longer pre-clears changing in voting registration. And after that, you've gotten a wave of uh, state laws um, that it is argued are leading to voting suppression. So that's a brief history of sort of the federal government role in this. I say that was spectacular, thank you. And thank you so much today for joining us virtually. Um, Dr. Etchison, we appreciate your expertise absolutely on a very timely program. Um, the chat is full of all sorts of thank yous. Um, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if you would like to rewatch this, we have recorded it. We will be editing it and posting it uh, both on our website, Lincoln Collection, uh, through LincolnCollection.org. Um, you can also watch our social media, especially Facebook, Lincoln Collection. You can see us there. And if you do have any questions or concerns about anything, please feel free to email us at Lincoln at ACPL, Allen County Public Library, dot info, ACPL dot info. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you next year uh, at 2021's Lincoln at the Libraries. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Emily. And if people have questions I didn't get to,
um, feel free to email me at Ball State and I'll try to tell you what I know. Thanks, Emily.